Hello and welcome to the Fish House Nation podcast. Today we're joined by Todd Heitkamp from Dakota Angler. Todd, welcome to the show. Well, thanks, Chris. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Well, we've had you on before, and we're going to have you on again. You and I ran into each other at a show not too long ago, and what people may not realize about you is that you're not only the owner of Dakota Angler, but you're also a meteorologist, and that's what we wanted to have you on today to talk about a little (laughs) bit of weather with us. Yeah, well, I, I've been a meteorologist for 38 years with the National Weather Service, and uh, you know, it's uh, kind of be able, to, kind of fun to be able to put the two uh, professions together, if you know what I mean. Yeah, they definitely go together. And I actually just ran across an article, I think, a day or two ago, about uh, what we're kind of looking at for this coming year. Uh, there was a meteorologist named Ryan Dunleavy from the National Weather Service out of Shakopee that was quoted in a, in a newspaper article talking about uh, La Nina and El Nino. And he, he believes that we're going to have an El Nino this year and uh, kind of went into a little bit about what he thought that would mean for our winter this year. Can you get into that a little bit for us? Well, I can. I, it'd be interesting to find out what Ryan actually said. <laughs> I'll send it to you, but basically what he said is uh, they're switching from a La Nina to an El Nino, and what he felt was that that was going to bring us a little bit warmer temperatures than usual, and he expected not as much snow as last year, but, um, you know, wet, heavy snow when we did get snow. Yeah, that's that's exactly what you we would expect for an El Nino year. Uh, you know, last year obviously has been a uh, – was uh, – a winter for the record books in many locations with plenty of snow around the area. Uh, and so the, there was uh, no doubt that uh, uh, that's a winter that we don't want to repeat, especially when it comes to uh, the ice fishing industry. But uh, right now, what we're expecting is a winter that's going to be a little bit different than last year, not as cold. Uh, but uh, with the warmer weather, that means the, the warmer the temperatures, the more moisture that air can actually hold. And therefore, any snowfall that does occur is going to be kind of the heavy, wet variety. And, uh, you know, we'll have to wait and see if that actually does hold true. How, how does that work? I mean, we, we hear those terms and it's something that, you know, if people who have watched the weather for a while, they've heard those terms. But what, are, what do those things mean? Well, you know, all it has to do with is the, you know, the, the temperature of the ocean currents off the coast of South America. Uh, when the water is warm, that, you know, and whatever temperature those ocean currents actually are. Uh, it has a global effect on the weather, and uh, that we've noticed that over the past, you know, how many hundreds, you know, I wish to say hundreds, maybe, if, you know, the past 50 years. And uh, more and more confidence has grown with that understanding. Uh, but we also know there's local effects or impacts on the weather that uh, will determine what type of weather is possible in the wintertime. So well, not only it, it does La Nina or El Nino have an impact or an effect on our weather, there's other things as well. So even though that El Nino gives us a, a warmer and typically a wetter winter, uh, there may be some o- other effects that may override that and actually influence uh, how much snow and how much cold we actually get uh, on a given year. Can you get into a little bit of that, Todd? What are some of those local things that could change what our winter looks like this year? Yeah, I mean, there's, a, you know, again, typically if we get a, a El Nino type of winter, uh, areas like eastern Minnesota, or let's say, let's split Minnesota down from uh, Baudette down through uh, Mankato and down towards Albert Lee. Basically, east of that line, we'll see a little bit more of a cooler winter. I won't, I won't say uh, you know, a cold winter, but a cooler winter than what areas to the west of that will experience a little bit warmer weather. So it really depends on where that jet stream sets up. And everyone has heard of the jet stream, but that's really what drives uh, our weather and drives it on a day-to-day basis. And typically when we do get El Nino event, uh, that will kind of separate our area. So even though that uh, we're forecasting this for one area, there's, a, you know, uh, I should say a larger area, there are smaller things that may determine what side of that jet stream you're on, and that will determine how much snow or how cold you actually will be on a, uh, a given season. Very interesting, Todd. Tell me a little bit about just on a day-to-day basis. Let's kind of imagine that we've got good ice to fish. Um, I know the barometric pressure can be a big deal when it comes to fishing. Can you tell us a little bit about how the barometric pressure affects fishing? 
Well, you know, we have all the latest uh, in the industry. We saw it at a show recently, Chris. You know, everyone's talking about the, the forward-facing sonars right now and uh, how that uh, impacts the, the fishing industry, the fishing business, and also the, the, the fish population. Well, there's so many things out there in the industry that will help you catch fish. There's one thing that you have to try to overcome that you don't have any piece of technology that allows you to do that. And that's uh, the effect or the impact that pressure has on a given day. Uh, on a day when we're dealing with high pressure, that's one of the days where it's going to be very difficult to catch fish because uh, uh, the, the, the bladder of the fish will inflate to allow them to basically overcome the effect of that uh, increased pressure and uh, they'll hug the bottom. Uh, they won't move. If you look at your sonar, uh, you'll see these fish uh, may come right up to your bait and then go right back down. They're curious, uh, but they're not going to be real hungry because their bladder is so full and it's occupying so much of their body. But on a low pressure day, when a storm is approaching, that's why the old adage that uh, fish bite best right before the storm, is that because that pressure is falling at that point in time, that means their bladder is shrinking. Uh, everything is, they're on the prowl. They're hungry. They're looking for fish. And so you don't need to go looking for them. They'll come to you. On those high pressure days, you need to basically go kamikaze fishing and looking for those active fish at that point in time. Yeah, and those, those high pressure days tend to be those high sun, super clear days. Um, and, and those are days that even when we're talking about open water fishing, tend to be difficult to catch fish in. Yeah, but then that's the day that everyone goes out because the weather is so nice, right? Uh, people don't want to put up with the, uh, uh, you know, the impacts of, of weather. But I always tell people, you know, pay attention to what the pressure is doing. And you can do that uh, by looking at the weather forecast. And if you have a wind out of the north, the northwest, that usually means the pressure is rising or it's very high. If the wind's out, uh, out of the south, that means the pressure is falling or the pressure is fairly uh, low. Go out whenever you can. But uh, at that point in time, if you know that the pressure is that high, you're just going to maybe have to change up your weather pattern, uh, change your fishing patterns up a little bit or your presentations up a little bit by going a little bit smaller uh, in the, uh, during the ice season. In the summertime, uh, you're going to troll a little bit more to go find those uh, active fish and cover a lot more water. Uh, on a low pressure day, like I said, when the wind's blowing out of the south, uh, again, t people don't need to really go looking for those fish. If you, you can sit there and jig for them all day long, whether or not you open water or uh, ice fishing and you're gonna you're gonna find fish yeah one of the things that when we're open water fishing wind can really have a huge effect i mean it, it affects our boat control it affects you know the waves and how that chop may affect what's going on down below as far as churning up some of those insects and food and things like that um, when when the ice is on a little bit different game can you tell me about how wind would affect fishing when we're ice fishing well, you know, wind really doesn't have much of a, an effect on us, uh, you know, as far as the, the, again, typically in the summertime, when you're looking at uh, uh, the effects of the wind, the wind will usually fish, push the, all the bait fish up into the windward side of the, uh, that lake. And a lot of times that's one of your best locations to go to. You're not going to have that same impact uh, during the wintertime with, with the wind. You're going to have some swelling of the water on the, on the windward side, but not much where you can actually tell the difference. The main impact is going to be the pressure, and the pressure is amplified that much more in the wintertime because the ice is taking up more volume in that water of that lake. So again, the pressure will tell you, uh, the wind will tell you what the pressure is actually doing at that point in time, and you need to plan or adjust appropriately. Yeah, is that pretty much the same story when it comes to temperature? I mean, it seems like when you're out there and it's, you know, negative five out, it's just hard to get a bite going. Even if you're toasty warm in your fish house or something like that, it just seems like the fish are super lethargic when it's that cold. But when you're out there and it's 30 degrees out, things are things are moving pretty good under the water. Yeah, and again, it's all pressure related. On those days when we have high pressure or those clear sunny days or those clear brisk mornings, that's when the temperature is going to be the coldest. That's where our coldest days actually will be. Uh, but our warmest days are going to be a little bit cloudy, and they're going to be having a wind out of that south. The, way the south wind is bringing up warmth or warmer temperatures from our south. So again, that's all related to that pressure. And on those cl clear sunny days when you're dealing with a, you know, uh, a temperature of, let's say 15 below zero, those are going to be those tough days where you need to adjust your uh, your pattern. Now, I'm not talking about wind chill. Wind chill is going to be totally different because uh, with that strong wind, that's being created by that south bre south breeze typically. Uh, so your, your, your coldest days with wind chills are typically going to be found 
uh, as the pressure is falling. Todd, your business is pretty technology focused. You know, you're using a lot of technology to put these weather forecasts together and check out models and things like that. Um, we talked a little bit about that El Nino, La Nina thing, but I noticed uh, the other day too, I was looking in, in the farmer's almanac actually uh, predicted pretty much the same thing that, that, that uh, Ryan Dunleavy did. Uh, what do you know about the farmer's almanac? Cause it seems like a lot of people kind of live and die by it and think it's right all the time. What, how do they come up with with those things? Well, I can tell you this much. I, I grew up on the Farmer's Almanac. Uh, my grandfather had it all the time, and I always called it bathroom re reading material because that's where usually people had it, was in the bathroom at that point in time. And, and then really, you know, the, it was developed by uh, those people just for as a source of entertainment, and they included a weather forecast in there uh, because, you know, that, that was, you know, information at that point in time, and they had a lot of fun you know, making up some, let's say, uh, less than factful uh, weather forecast. Uh, but uh, nowadays they put as much science into use a lot of uh, information that we provide as well. Uh, but again, you got to remember with the farmer's Al almanac, it's using this broad brush and giving that weather forecast that says, yeah, you can expect some snow in the wintertime in the northern Minnesota and you can expect some sun. Well, I mean, anyone can get that forecast right uh that's what you would expect in the winter time is a, a little bit of snow and a little bit of cold so uh, again that you have to take those forecasts with a little bit, bit of little grain of salt but it's gotten a lot better than what it was uh let's say you know 30 40 50 years ago well when we're fishermen we are used to things that are less than factual i like that line <laughs> less than factual yeah, that's why i always tell people you know i'm a weather forecaster and i don't have any chops so i get to lie, lie at you twice <laughs> Todd, is there uh, anything I didn't ask you that you wanted to bring up today about weather? I think the main thing is, uh, no matter if you're talking about open water or ice fishing, is to stay prepared by the first thing anyone should look at is the weather forecast. Uh, that will tell you, number one, if you're if we're expecting any type of impactful weather, things that may actually harm your safety or the safety of others that you're going out with at that point in time. Uh, and if it is, then postpone it and you know go out at a later time. But the other thing is, to pay attention to the weather forecast, uh, pay attention to the wind. Uh, as we said, you're dealing with that south wind, you're not gonna have to maybe troll as much as you otherwise would. Uh, you know, you can get into snap jigging in the summertime, you can jig, you name it. But when that wind's out of the north northwest and the pressure's high and you're on those sky high days, you're gonna have to uh, really change your weather pattern and find those active fish. And you're gonna have to drill a lot of holes in the winter time or use your forward facing sonar a lot more in the winter time than you otherwise would. Uh, and then in the summertime, you're probably going to have to troll and cover a lot more uh, water at that time to find those active fish. Well, Todd, you're obviously passionate about the weather, but uh, another thing you're passionate about, and we always talk about when we see you, is the Dakota Ice Institute, and that's coming up here pretty soon as well. Um, tell us a little bit about that, when it's going to happen, and uh, just tell me how, how the planning is going right now. Yeah, this is the 15th year of the Dakota Angler Ice Institute. It's held in uh, the Sioux Falls Arena Convention Center. This year's dates are November 10th through the 12th, and this proves to be the biggest and best better, best one ever. Uh, we have more vendors than ever before, and, uh, you know, this is a, something that my family puts together. This is not done by a promoter or anything like that. I have a dog in the race, so to speak. It's my show. It's my store, and uh, my goal is to provide a show where people can come, take advantage of all the great deals that you would uh, come to expect at a show, but then also to participate in some of the seminars to learn more how to use that equipment. That's why we call it the Ice Institute, a place of learning, uh, not only to buy it, but you can learn how to use it. And that's what we're hoping people will do. Uh, we got a great lineup of, uh, of vendors, including, you know, catch cover, including, uh, you know, a catch and cook batter. We also have Eskimo, Ion, uh, all the main partners that you would expect to be at the show will be there. Uh, November 10th through the 12th here at the Sioux Falls Arena Convention Center. Yeah, tell me a little bit about that. You talked about the seminars. Um, who are some of the people that you'll have speaking and, and what are some of the topics? I mean, I guess the main question that I have is, is for our audience anyway, is what's special about the Institute? Why would somebody maybe take a run out there if they live in the, in the Twin Cities metro area and they've got the St. Paul show? But I see a lot of those people come out to your show what are they coming out there to get? 
Well, you know, again, uh, number one, a lot of people are so familiar with the, the St. Paul Ice Show. Uh, this is, we are the second largest ice fishing show behind St. Paul. We'll probably never, ever pass that, to say the least. But uh, it's one of those things where you get to experience the same thing in, uh, here in Sioux Falls as you would in St. Paul, Paul. But also we have a, a, some great speakers. Uh, we have Brad Hawthorne. We also have uh, a, a GF&P officer from uh, South Dakota here that will give... Uh, his presentation Friday night on the state of the lakes. You know, we have a lot of lakes around our area that are down quite a bit from the past uh, year or two years. Uh, and so he's going to give an idea on what those lakes are going to be doing and we'll also pay, to pay attention to some of the stocking reports. So we'll talk about that. We'll also uh, we're, uh, have a, a new speaker in from uh, Canada. His name is Wes David. Uh, he's going to be talking about fishing uh, Lake Winnipeg uh, up there. So we're trying to bring in some of that northern influence into our area because we have a lot of people that go up there and during the wintertime. Uh, we also have uh, Dwayne Jell uh, that will be in the uh, in the show on over the weekend. Uh, Dwayne has you know known uh, with it, best known in the NWT. He was the 2022 Angler of the Year. So he will be there providing a little question and answer period. Uh, we also have Matt Johnson and then also uh, someone else on the NWT uh, circuit uh, that uh, is good. I think he finished in the top 10 for angler of the year. Don't uh, don't uh, hold me to that. Uh, but he is uh, from Northland uh, uh, tackle and uh, his name is Wes. Uh, no, excuse me. I just all of a sudden just uh, uh, escaped me at that point in time. Uh, but yeah, his name is Will uh, Poppin. Poppenfuss. I can never get that correctly. So sorry for the, the mistake there, Will. Yeah, Will's a great guy, big walleye Will, and he's uh, you see him kind of all over the place. Really good guy, very, very uh, knowledgeable as well. A good guy to talk to if you want to get into walleyes. He's, he's going to be the guy to talk to. Um, Todd, tell me just about what, what you've got on tap for this ice season. What are you looking forward to the most? Well, you know, I think the, the main thing that we're looking forward to is hopefully having a year that people can get out. I mean, last year uh, we had a great ice show. Uh, and then after that, the, the weather definitely turned south, uh, no pun intended. Uh, we had a lot of snow around the area. Uh, we had great ice, to say the least, but people could not get out because we had so much snow on the ice. Uh, so hopefully, you know, as brief as our uh, ice season is around the upper Midwest, it would be nice to have a year where people can get out on the ice safely not have to deal with as, as much snow. And that means I will sell all the things that I have in the store, which makes me very happy at that point in time. Yeah, it's nice to have a clean warehouse at the end yes. of the season. Everybody no can appreciate that. And even the anglers can appreciate because that means they, they were able to get out and do some fishing. So it's a win for everybody when that happens. Yep. Uh, people want to find out more about the Dakota Angler Ice Institute. Where should they go to get some more information? Well, first off, they can give us a call at 605-336-9132, or they could go to our own Ice Institute website, which is dakotaanglericeinstitute.com. And that will have all the vendors on there and eventually all the seminar times as well. Uh, but again, if you have any questions, don't hesitate to reach out and give us a call. Is there anything you wanted to bring up that I didn't ask you about, Todd? I think, you know, I think we covered pretty much all, uh, you know, all of it. But I think, uh, you know, I hope that uh, uh, those of you that come to the show, that listen to the podcast, make sure you come on out and, and introduce yourself to me. I may be running around looking like I have my head cut off, but that's typical. That's why I don't have any hair anymore. Uh, but stop on by and uh, say hi. I'd love to meet you. He's Todd Heitkamp from Dakota Angler. We appreciate your time for coming on the show. Hope everyone enjoyed this show, and we'll talk to you next time. Sounds great. Thanks, Chris.